on to chapter two, which is about discrete random variables. So for the remainder of this course, what we're going to be doing is shifting our uh, modeling to just random numbers. Before we had any kind of uh, object, maybe random cards, letters, words, movies, whatever came to mind. And now we're gonna be solely focused on random numbers. The main reason we're doing this is that it opens the door to more powerful techniques. It allows us to unify everything and start generating a lot of um, more sophisticated ideas. And you know, another one is it allows us to model dependencies between random numbers more easily. So you can think about things like correlation a bit later on. Um, and the other thing is that even though we're going to be talking about random numbers, you can always map back to the thing that you were originally interested in. So if you're interested in words, so if you're trying to do some kind of uh, text processing, you could come up with a numerical representation and then map back to it. Formally speaking, a random variable denoted by a capital letter here, in this case X, but it could be Y, Z, or really anything else that you like, um, it's going to be a function and it maps the outcomes from the sample space to real numbers. So it takes elements of the sample space omega to the real line, such that for any interval a to b, the set of outcomes that map, um, so the set of outcomes that map into that interval through the function established by the random variable, that set has to belong to the event space e. Now this is a technical definition and the main thing I want you to know about it is that you don't need to worry about it. I need to say it just to make sure that we're on solid footing, but you should just presume throughout the entire course that every random variable has this property. And moreover, you don't even really need to worry about how to use this property. This is just the formal definition. All right, let's visualize this. So I have a bunch of outcomes and I have my real line. And all I'm going to be doing is just mapping them to some numbers. So here, omega one went to x one, which is a number that from this illustration is positive. Omega two went to x three, omega three went to x two, and omega four went to x two. So a couple of things. Um, we don't need to actually uh, preserve any order that existed in the sample space, right? So it looks like there were order left to right in the sample space and that got mixed up going to the real line. That's fine. And you could map multiple things to the same number. That's also fine. We're usually going to write out our random variables using the notation um, with uppercase letters. And we'll usually use letters such as X, Y, and Z, maybe dipping a little further, U, V, W. We'll stay at the um, end of the alphabet. Okay, that's just a typical convention. And we're going to denote the specific values that a random variable can take with lowercase letters, all right? So little x, little y, and little z. So if you're thinking about the actual random variable or number, then you write capital X. And if I'm saying, trying to refer you to a value it could take, I might say little x equals to one is one of those values. All right, the range r sub x, that's just the range of this function of the random variable. It's really just the values the random variable can take. And we say that the random variable is going to be discrete if the range is countable. And all that means is that it's basically finite or you could index it from one to infinity in some way. Formally, we're going to say that the experiment is the source of randomness and x is a function of the outcome. So it's kind of getting its randomness from the experiment. But in most cases, it's going to be helpful for our intuition to just think that X is the source of the randomness. Okay, and again, there's some technical nuances here. You don't need to worry about any of them. If you're looking at this a bit later, taking a more advanced course, maybe some of those subtleties will matter, but it's completely fine to just presume the randomness is in the random variable X. Let's do some examples. So in experiment one, what I'm going to be doing is counting the number of photons that hit a CCD pixel, maybe on my digital camera, in one millisecond. The sample space is gonna be zero, one, two, and so on. So basically, it's just a natural number count of the number of photons. And I'm going to say my random variable here is that number of photons, and so its range is again zero, one, two, and so on. And 
here x is the same as the outcome and that's totally fine my sample space were, was the natural numbers and i just decided that's what i was interested in and in this case x is a discrete random variable because it is countable i could index this from one to infinity in experiment two let's look at a similar scenario all i'm going to do is measure the exact time between the arrival of the first and second photons okay and i'm going to be super precise about this i'm going to get it down to the very last decimal place so i'm really thinking about non-negative real numbers i'm again going to take the random variable to just be this little omega and the range is going to be the same all right again x is the same as the outcome here but x is not a discrete random variable because i have an uncountable set and there's a subtlety there why is that uncountable um, you can look in your uh, lecture notes or some other textbook to see what that means but it's not discrete Experiment three, I'm gonna roll two four-sided dice, and my sample space is going to be the pairs i, j, where i and j take values in one, two, three, and four. And now I'm gonna say that x is the sum of the rolls. Often when I'm playing a game with dice, I just care about the sum of the rolls. And so x is going to be the sum of i, j, right? And so the range is gonna be two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight because those are the possible sums I could get from summing up two things that go from one to four. And so now X is a function of the outcome. It's still discrete because I have a finite number of choices for the values of X, but it's a function of the outcome, not the original outcome, which we had in the first two examples. Let's stay in the same setup. So we're gonna keep X the same. So we define X in the same way as the sum of the roles and take Y to be X squared. What's the range of y going to be? Well, we're just going to square all the possible values of x. So I'm going to get 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, 64. So y is a function of the random variable x and is itself a random variable. Why is that true? Well, a function of a function is just some other function, right? So if I compose functions together, I just end up with a function. So that's just the definition of a random variable. It's a function of the outcome. Again, it's going to be discrete because there's a finite number of choices for values of y. And finally, let's do something a little bit more in depth. So in this experiment, I'm asking a student, a fellow student about their letter grade in a particular class. And we're gonna just assume that there are five possible letter grades, A, B, c d and f okay so no pluses and minuses just to keep this simple and so this random variable x is going to map a to 4 b to 3 c to 2 d to 1 and f to 0 right and so the range is just 0 1 2 3 4 and these are grade points right so x is mapping these letters to real numbers and this is a useful thing to do because sometimes we want to compute things like the grade point average, okay? So if I was just working with the letter grades and I told you that my grade point average was A, B-ish, okay, that kind of gives you an idea, but it doesn't capture it as uh, precisely as the grade point average, which gives you a really um, a good intuition for how many A's, B's, and C's you're going to see and what kind of mixture, right? So that's why we like to do things like that because we can compute averages, we can look at other statistics. So it's a very nice thing to do. Again, it's discrete, there's a finite range, and I can visualize this by just putting A, B, C, D, and F abstractly in the sample space and mapping them to the real line. Like I said, A to four, B to three, C to two, F to zero, and D to one, okay? So this is a more in-depth example. All right, so the main concept we're going to be using with discrete random variables is the probability mass function, the PMF. Formally, the probability mass function, or PMF, is written P sub X, so that's big X if you're interested, and then I put in little x, that's the thing I'm plugging in, the possible values I'm plugging in. This is a function whose input is a possible value, X in the range of uh, the random variable X, Okay, and its outcome, or sorry, its output is the probability that X assumes this value. All right, so what I'm doing is I'm taking this function, I'm plugging in X, and then what it's doing is it's 
calculating the probability of all of the outcomes that actually map to that value, little x. So I take the outcomes, little omega, I plug them into my random variable, I see if they land up on little x, and I take all of those together as a set and I compute their probability. Now this is kind of involved. So what we usually do is we write the shorthand notation, just x is equal to x, and I often drop the brackets. The brackets are there so I know that this is really standing in for a set. And then I often drop the brackets because it's just annoying to keep around. So this last thing is what we're going to be using uh, most frequently. So the notation, just probability of big X is equal to little x, that's what we're going to use most of the time. And it's just important to remember that um, behind the scenes, the probabilities are assigned to the events, which are sets, and these are uh, subsets of the sample space in the beginning. Okay, But it's really the most convenient to just talk about the probability of the random thing, capital X, taking a value, little x, and then working out what that is. It's going to be more clear through an example. So we'll go back to experiment three. What we were doing there was rolling two four-sided dice, and all the outcomes were equally likely, and we just looked at the sum of the rolls. So what we had was the sample space, the pairs ij, which took values in one, two, three, four. We took their sum. We ended up with the range two through eight. Okay, what is the probability that x is equal to 2? Well, which pairs map to 2 if I take their sum? It's only 1, 1. So I calculate the probability of 1, 1, and that's going to be 1 over 16. The reason it's 1 over 16 is that there are 16 possible fares, pairs because I have 4 uh, choices for each dice, so 4 times 4 is 16. And we said all outcomes are equally likely. This is one out of those 16 outcomes, so the probability is one in 16. Okay, what's the probability that x is equal to three? Well, there are two pairs, one and two, and then two and one. Those both map to three if I take their sum. And so there are two of them out of 16, and that's gonna be one eighth. What about the probability that x is four? Well, what sums to four? I'm gonna have one, three, two, two, and then three, one. And this 3 out of 16 is the probability. What about 5? I'm going to have 1, 4, 2, 3, 3, 2, 4, 1. And that is going to be uh, 4 out of 16 or 1 fourth. And now we're going to be going back down. So the probability of seeing 6 as the sum, there I'm going to see 2, 4, 3, 3, or 4, 2. So that's three things, 3 out of 16. Probability of x is equal to 7. That's going to be uh, 3, 4, or 4, 3. That's two things, so probability is 1 out of 8. And uh, finally, for 8, I just left with uh, 4, 4. That's going to be 1 over 16. Okay, so we calculated the PMF. It was a little bit annoying. And honestly, if you're working out your own problems, you don't need to write it out in this much detail. I'm just doing this to be uh, clear for you as a long example. All right, there are three useful ways for us to write out a PMF, okay? And each of them is useful in different contexts. You should just pick what works best for you. The first one is I can write it as a case-by-case -case formula. So what I'm gonna do in this case is the, I'm gonna write P of X could be equal to one over 16, that happens when X is two or eight. One over eight happens when it's three or seven. Three over 16 when it's four or six. And one over four when it's five. Okay, so all I did is I took these values from the left-hand side, I figured out which ones uh, were shared, and I just wrote that out as a case-by-case -case formula. The next thing is a plot. So the plot lets us see things like symmetries. So here I'm going to write on the x-axis just x. I'm going to take the values 2 through 8 and just put them down, and I'm going to just start plotting this PMF. Okay? Its values are 1 in 16, 1 in 8, 3 in 16, 1 in 4. So I go up, right? so I'm ascending and then descending, and I can see that this is a very nice symmetric PMF centered at 5. Okay, and maybe that was a little harder to see from the case-by-case -case formula. And the third way that you might see it written, um, which is more helpful in some more involved scenarios, but here I just write it as a table. So I write 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then just fill in the values in this table. And it's just good to see this because we're going to use this a little bit more later on, and this is a simple example to get familiar with it. So I just fill in the values of the table. Okay, so three useful ways to write out a PMF. And again, in a simple scenario like this, you should feel comfortable eventually just writing out 
uh, the formula directly if you think you can see it um, just from the setup. And if you need to work out some details, you can also do that. What are some basic properties of a PMF? Well, they're just the properties that we learn from probability. So the first one is that you can't have negative values. So non-negativity tells us that the PMF has to be greater than or equal to zero at every point. Then we also know that the PMF has to sum to one. That is normalization, all right? So we know that probability has to sum to one. So if I add up all the values in the range of X and I plug them into this uh, PMF formula, I know I should be getting one. What if I plug in a value that's not in the range? Well, that is by default zero. Usually we don't even bother to write it, but let's say the range just had a couple of values and you plugged in another value, you can just interpret that as zero. Okay, and finally, for any event that's a subset of the range, the probability that X, this random number, falls into that set B is, sometimes we write it like this, probability of um, X, in B. Sometimes we write it as probability of the set X in B, right? And we can think about it as just adding up those values. Okay, so let me just write this thing in green and we can talk about it. So really what we're asking about here implicitly and that we usually won't worry about is the probability of the set of outcomes that are getting mapped into a value of X that falls into the set B. That's too complicated for us to usually worry about. All we're really saying here is I have a random number, X, and I have a set B. What's the probability that X takes one of the values in B? And all I can do is just add up the PMF values where X falls into B. I don't need to worry about overlaps, and that's a really nice thing about random variables. Before, we had to make sure that things were mutually exclusive, but values of a random variable are automatically mutually exclusive, right? So if I have uh, one and two as possible values, those don't overlap. So I don't even need to worry about um, mutual exclusivity. That's automatically given. I just get to add up their values. Okay, and just to establish this notation a bit more clearly, so when I'm saying sum up in X and B, what I mean is add up the PMF for every X that belongs to the set B. So for example, if I have B158 and I say probability, uh, take the sum of X and B of the PMF, what that means is add up the PMF value for one to the PMF for five to the PMF for eight, okay? So this notation where you see this X belongs to B underneath the summation just means add up the values where that X actually falls into B. So let's wrap all of this up with a longer example. So I'm gonna give you a case-by-case -case formula for the PMF. It's gonna be a tenth when X is equal to negative one half, uh, two tenths when X is equal to minus one, zero, and one, and three tenths when X is equal to plus one half, okay? So this is just an abstract thing. I'm not thinking about it as having any special meaning. We're just trying to work out uh, some of these formulas, okay? I'm going to also plot this so we can visualize what we're doing. So I'm going to plot the PMF. I'm going to draw out the range, which goes from minus one um, to plus one with these half steps. Okay, and the values I can have are one tenth, two tenths, and three tenths. I'm going to plot the PMF. So starting at uh, minus one half, I have one tenth, then I have these two tenth values, three spots, and then I have this three tenths value at plus one half. Okay, so what's the probability that x is equal to plus one half? So again, this is a shorthand for writing something about the set of outcomes that get mapped to one half. We don't need to worry about that. All we need to worry about when we see something like this is just look up the PMF value at plus one half, and we see that that's going to be three tenths. That's it, nothing more than that. Okay, what about something a little more complicated? What if I ask you, what's the probability that x is greater than zero? Formally, what I'm asking you is what's the probability that the outcomes get mapped to an X value that is greater than zero. But again, we don't need to go and write that formally. All we need to do is remember that everything that we're talking about can be thought about as belonging to a set. Here we're asking whether X belongs to the set B, and the set B are the values in the range of X that are greater than zero. And all we have to do is figure out what those values are. In this case, they're plus one half 
and plus one, okay? And the reason for that is that the range of x is really minus one, minus one half, zero, and plus one half, and plus one. And if you look at those all together, the only values that satisfy greater than zero are plus one half and plus one. Okay, so that's going to be my set B. So I use this additivity formula. So I sum up X and B, the PMF values, and here they are on this PMF. So all I'm doing is adding up um, the probability at one half with the probability at one, and I'm seeing three tenths plus two tenths. That's just the half, okay? So in the end, it's a pretty simple uh, calculation. The only thing that's tricky about this is translating that condition into the values that I need to add up. Okay, and the thing to really remember throughout this whole course is that any probability question you encounter, whether in plain language or some kind of weird mathematics, it's always talking about membership in a set, okay? Why is that? It's because when we talk about probabilities, probabilities are only calculated on events those are subsets of the sample space. In this case, let's say I'm interested in the probability that X is negative. Well, I could write that as probability of X being less than zero, but to be really explicit about it, like we were above, what I really mean here in the context of this problem is the probability that X belongs to the set A, okay? And A are the values in the range where x is less than zero. In this specific case, I have minus one and minus one half, and I'll draw this up there, right? So those are the values of, um, that satisfy this condition. Okay, and once I see that those are the values, I know to calculate this probability, I could just add up their values from the PMF formula as I had above. I'm not gonna do that on the slide, but it would just be uh, 3 tenths, right? And so anything you end up with, just remember you can always work out what the set is and then it's pretty easy to just look up the values and add up their probabilities.